Good morning. The Lord be with you. This is like the perfect Sunday to sleep in, and I'm really glad you didn't. Those of you and those who are watching live, although you're a little more comfortable than we are here in the pews, but that's okay. For those of you who are here in person, a reminder, please keep your masks on at all times, uh, including over your nose and your mouth. That's what's helpful for everybody and try to keep your distance. You're doing a great job so far, but I know as soon as you get up, we all wanna talk. There will be no fellowship hour today or for the foreseeable future, so you just have to go home and eat your own snacks. And there's also, um, for those of you in the sanctuary, we ask that you do not sing along with the hymns. Uh, if you're at home, feel free. You can sing as much as you want. But here in the sanctuary, just invite you to listen. And, um, but you are invited to join. If you're here at home, you can yell it. I don't care. Um, but you are invited to pray that. And please wait to be dismissed after the end of the service. I dismiss you out so that way we don't all away. If you have a prayer request you would like lifted up this morning and it can be publicly shared with the world, feel free free to text it to me, mine's in the bulletin for those of you who are here, or at home you can text it to me or put it in the comments, either in Facebook or Zoom, and I will uh, be watching for those. I have reinstituted office hours on Wednesdays from 5, so I will be in the office. I was a little late this week, Ellen caught me, but generally I speak on Wednesdays. And if you need me for anything, um, and when say doesn't work, let to meet you by appointment or evenings. Next Sunday, first Sunday of March, which means that it's a communion Sunday. For those of you who are here in the sanctuary and plan to be here next week, we invite you to bring your own, like you've been doing. Now. We will have some yet, so if you realize on the you uh, didn't bring them that's okay we will have some but I think you'll probably enjoy the ones you bring more so please bring your communion elements with you next Sunday there are a few inserts in the bulletin for those of you who are here in person the first is about college care packages the deacons are again sending out little gifts to all of our college students if you have a college student in your life that you receive a note from the church Church, you offering plate, or if you're at home, you can uh, this one in the newsletter, right, Ellen? You can fill out the one that's in the newsletter and mail it in, or you can just call the church office, and we will be glad to get them signed up. The other two inserts are for flowers. One is for Easter flowers. Uh, you have a choice of lily, tulips, or hyacinths, um, and so you can fill those out if you want to beautify our sanctuary on Easter morning. Both the college care package and the Easter flower signups are due on March 14th, so please plan ahead for those. And then the pink one is for chancel flowers. If you would like to beautify our sanctuary any Sunday morning, feel free to fill one of those out. If you have questions about dates, some of them are in the bulletin, but give Ellen a call. Um, she's keeping all of that stuff electronically, so she'll be able to help you out with that. Last week, I, for, I neglected to mention this, last week our flowers, chancel flowers, were in honor of the health care workers at Butler Memorial Hospital and given with love by Susan Catanzarito. And this morning, our, our flowers were given in love by Ann Miller and her family in memory of Palmer and Fern Autry, Ann's parents, on their 70th wedding anniversary. So we give thanks for that. Also, thank you to those who are helping with worship this morning. I'm always grateful for Nancy and for Tom. Our liturgist this morning is Suzanne Fries. She's joining us via pre-recorded video. That's why you don't see her here. Uh, and also thank you to Anne and Becky and Pete for helping get the building ready for worship this morning. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship God.
Good morning. Let us join together in our call to worship. It is too easy to allow our faith to become an escape, a way to avoid the pain of being human and alive. It is too easy to allow our faith to become a path to success, a way to persuade the universe to give us the things we want. It is too easy to allow our faith to become a system of control, a way to bend others to our will. But the faith that Jesus offers is different. It is dangerous and compelling. It's the faith that carries the cross, that embraces death and lays itself down for the sake of others. It's the only faith that can lead us to resurrection, to life renewed and overflowing. Open your hearts to receive this faith, and with faith, let us worship God. Let us pray. Great God of dazzling beauty and overshadowing majesty, in Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, we glimpse the image of your glory. Teach us to listen to him so that we may hear your voice and follow your holy way. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lent is about repentance, about turning and changing. And often the first step to change is listening. We have to listen to those we've hurt. We have to listen to creation as she cries out. We have to listen to the voice of the oppressed if we ever hope to make things right. So today, as we begin our prayer of confession, we will start with a moment of silence, a moment to listen. And then we will pray together, trusting that God is always listening to us and that God's ears listen with love. So let us confess silently before God.
listening God. Take what is closed in us and open it. Take what is distracted in us and settle it. Take what is hurting in us and hold it. Take any and all parts of us that create distance from you. For we are like Peter, O oh God. We argue what we don't know. We fear what we cannot see. And we almost always speak sooner than we listen. So open us, settle us, hold us, and forgive us. We long to hear you more clearly. We long to know you more fully. With hope we pray, and with gratitude we confess. Amen. Friends, we confess with gratitude because we know that God has already heard and forgiven us. No matter what we have done or left undone, we are held in God's hand. So rest in this good news. God invites us in. God meets us right where we are. God hears our prayer and God forgives us. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Knowing that we are forgiven brings us peace. And so at this time, you are invited to share the peace of Christ with those around you. If you're here in the sanctuary, feel free to turn around and wave to one another. And the peace of Christ be with you at home as well. Oh, that makes me so happy. If we have any of our young friends joining us at home, you are invited to come a little closer for a special time with you. I wanted to show you all something that I uh, just got myself. It's something I've been thinking of getting for quite a while, but I decided now was the time. And I got myself a coffee mug because, you know, I need more of those. But this one is a, is a special one. And if you've been with me on a Zoom meeting of any sort, you will find this quite funny. It's a, and I don't know if you can see it. So Tom's got a picture of it. It says, you're on mute. <laughs> if I had a dollar for every time I had to say, you're on mute this past year, I wouldn't need this job. You're on mute. For kids at home, you probably by now are used to Zoom or Google Meets or something else where you're video chatting with people, and often you can mute yourself. For my son Gabe, when he's in class, he has to stay muted unless the teacher calls on him. And that's proper etiquette. We mute ourselves when we're not speaking. But sometimes we forget we're muted, and then we start talking, and then I have to say, you're on mute. It's hard to listen to people when we can't hear them. Sometimes you can see that they're talking or you can see that they're scrambling, trying to figure out how to get their sound on. We can't listen if people are muted. So sometimes being on mute is not a great thing. But sometimes being on mute is good. It's important because we also can't listen if we are talking. If we are doing the talking when someone else is trying to talk, then we're just talking over each other and we can't listen to one another. So I invite you this week 
to unmute yourself when you need to, when you have something important to say, but also don't be afraid to mute yourself when someone else is speaking. Ensure that you can hear what they're saying too. That's the only way we can make it through together, is if we listen to one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, we cannot hear the trees growing, seeds pushing up through the dirt into the sun, and we cannot hear a single drop of rain, missing one in the many. We cannot hear the weight of people's grief, a burden that so often is silent. And we cannot hear when hearts are changed, but you can, you hear it all. So once again, we come to you with bowed heads and hopeful hearts, asking that you would lend us your ears. Help us to hear as you hear, so that we can live as you lived. We are listening. Amen. Our word from the psalmist today is Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31 from the Common English Bible. This psalm, attributed to David, is a plea for deliverance from suffering and hostility. Listen now for God's word to us. All of you who revere the Lord, praise him. All of you who are Jacob's descendants, honor him. All of you who are all Israel's offspring, stand in awe of him. Because he didn't despise or detest the suffering of the one who suffered, he didn't hide his face from me. No, he listened when I cried out to him for help. I offer praise in the great congregation because of you. I will fulfill my promises in the presence of those who honor God. Let all those who are suffering eat and be full. Let all who seek the Lord praise him. I pray your hearts live forever. Every part of the earth will remember and come back to the Lord. Every family among all the nations will worship you. Because the right to rule belongs to the Lord, he rules all nations. Indeed, all the earth's powerful will worship him. All who are descending to the dust will kneel before him. My being also lives for him. Future descendants will serve him. Generations to come will be told about my Lord. They will proclaim God's righteousness to those not yet born, telling them what God has done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark. We'll be reading chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. If you're following along in the bulletin, it's a little shorter than what's printed in there. I didn't think you all would mind if I cut the scripture a little bit. So this is Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And this is from the New Revised Standard Version. Here Jesus tells the disciples about his suffering to come, and we see how they respond. Listen again for God's word to us. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they gain in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when, it comes, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, again and again you call us to be still and to listen to hear what you are saying to us through your word and scripture, through our experience in your creation, and through what we hear from one another. Still us, God. Help us to set aside our distractions and focus on listening to you. Fill us with your spirit. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week I had the opportunity to sit down and chat with our new executive presbyter, Tom Harmon. We talked about some presbytery business. Tom and I have known each other since I've been here. But we also had quite a discussion about pandemic church. We've been doing this for almost a year now. And as we're coming up on the one-year mark, I've been thinking back, especially to that Sunday where we made the decision to close the building. It was March 15th, 2020. The session was gathered back in the hall lounge, and we were distant, but not wearing masks yet, because we just didn't know. There was so much we didn't know. We'd been hearing about this strange illness now for a couple of months, and we realized that we needed to really think about spending some time in quarantine. At that point, a number of scientific leaders were saying, two weeks. If we could just hunker down for two weeks, we'll be over the worst of it. Well, that's what we initially chose to do, to close the building for two weeks. And here we are, 50 weeks later. We've been able to reopen the building, but it's not the same. And many of our community are still joining virtually. Reverend Harmon and I talked about how, in retrospect, 
That two-week idea was pretty ridiculous, especially because there were scientific experts who said two weeks is not enough. There were people who said, even then, that this was going to last into the summer or into the fall or even next spring. And here we are. And Tom and I both agreed that while we too heard these voices, we heard what they had to say, we didn't want to listen. I personally thought it might be more than two weeks, but I was really hopeful we'd be back in the sanctuary by Easter. We didn't want to accept what those experts had to say. And so we only listened to the voices that made us the most comfortable. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is the physical act of sound entering your ears. Listening is paying attention. And we all, <clears throat> excuse me, we all know that we can hear something, but not listen to it. David and I, our first apartment was located right in between two hospitals and on the main road that went through the city. And so the sounds of police cars and ambulances and fire trucks was common, very common. And at first we would hear and listen to every single siren. It would catch us off guard. But as we got more adjusted, as we lived there for a while, although we could obviously hear the sirens right outside our window, we just stopped listening to them. We stopped paying attention. And this is true for those who live near railroad tracks or airports or any other place that is noisy. You just get used to it. I had a colleague share this week about having an infant at home who is very medically vulnerable. And he's attached to a lot of alarms. And one of the things that is most dangerous for their family is alarm fatigue, is becoming so accustomed to hearing these alarms that they no longer pay attention to them. This past summer, our nation saw a number of protests calling for racial justice. And those who were on the streets, those who were crying out, wanted people to listen. They didn't just want to be heard. When people are crying out, it's hard to miss that. But they wanted people to pay attention to what they were saying and to what they continue to say, to listen to their stories, stories of racial profiling, of being followed because of the color of their skin, the fear of going out in public, I've heard a lot of my white siblings, especially in the past year, say that this has all gone too far. There are better ways to do this. But the problem is not with those on the street. The problem is with those of us who won't listen. In my abundance of spare time this past year, I've been engaged in some intentional anti-racism work. It's not easy. As a white person, it requires me to explore my own biases, conscious and subconscious. It requires me to admit at times that I was wrong. And it requires me to repent, very Lenten, and it calls me to do better in the future. But most importantly, anti-racism work requires me to be quiet, to mute myself. It forces me to not only step out of my comfort zone, but to listen to others. It means that I don't just hear what they're saying, but I pay attention. As many of you know, we've been doing kindergarten virtually with Gabe since September. And there are 
times throughout the day that his class meets live on Google Meets about 30 kids or so, and the teacher. And one of the biggest things that we've had to deal with in my house is the student talking while others are talking, the student being my son. I have been known to say on many occasions, I said this multiple times on Friday, you can't be listening if you're talking. You can't be listening if you're talking. Listening is difficult. And in my experience with anti-racism training, it is hard, hard work. It forces us to face the truth that maybe things aren't quite what we think they are. And many people, for this reason, are not willing to listen. And so as a result, for centuries, those with racial privilege in this country have attempted to quiet the voices of others. We would rather talk than listen. We just don't want to hear it. We don't want to know what others are experiencing because it makes us uncomfortable. And so we try to shut it down. And that's exactly what Peter is doing in the scripture passage today. Immediately prior to where we started reading, Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? And then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, in all of his self-righteousness, says, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus goes on to tell them what we read today, that he must undergo great suffering that he will be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the legal experts. Jesus tells his disciples, those closest to him, that he will be killed. And Peter doesn't want to hear it. In his mind, in Peter's mind, the Messiah is not subject to this kind of treatment. In his mind, the Messiah overcomes violence. The Messiah is the conqueror, not the conquered. And so Mark tells us that Jesus, or that Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him. Peter didn't just whisper quietly in Jesus' ear, maybe you should calm it down a bit. Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him reprimands him, scolds him for telling the truth. What Jesus had to say about his identity as the Son of Man, as the Messiah, did not align with Peter's preconceived notions. And so Peter tried to silence Jesus. Just imagine that for a moment. The one who literally just said that he believes that Jesus is the Messiah has the audacity to turn around and rebuke him. How on earth could Peter think that he knew who Jesus was better than Jesus did? Jesus had just said, this is who I am. I am the son of man. He's referring back to the prophet Daniel. And Peter said, then I don't think you're right about what's coming next. What hubris it takes to believe that we know somebody better than they know themselves. That we better understand their life experiences than they do. And this, of course, is not just reserved for Peter. We all do this. Rather than truly listening to the stories of others, we choose to impart our own understanding on them. We project what we think onto them. And this lack of listening, of truly paying attention to what someone else is saying, is, I believe, the root of so many of the problems we are facing right now. Not just when it comes to racial justice, but things like gender equality and systemic poverty, and so much more. There were, a few years ago, a series of videos that came out 
where male clergy were reading things that female clergy had, um, had told to them by uh, congregation members. Things about their body, things about their appearance, things denigrating them as women. As a female clergy person, I've heard it all too. And these videos went viral. And everybody was appalled. The men in these videos, some of them cried, they wept, they were frustrated and disgusted. But the female clergy, I know, and I know a lot, hated these videos. Because we all said, we've been saying this for years. You just weren't listening. It took somebody else to say it for people to listen. And that's very frustrating when you are the one trying to get your story told. Again and again and again, there are people who speak the truth. There are people who are incredibly vulnerable and they allow that vulnerability enough to share their experiences, to say, this is what it's like for me. And again and again, Others try to silence them. They try to shut it down. They don't want to hear it. They don't listen. And far too often, those who are telling the truth are pulled aside and rebuked or scolded or reprimanded for speaking up. Now, I'm a big proponent of encouraging people to tell the truth, even when it's hard even when it's painful, but I'm an equally big proponent of encouraging people to listen. You can't be listening when you're talking. If we are constantly doing the talking, if we are constantly the ones sharing our opinions, we leave no room for listening. And I understand the irony of that being here, up here, doing, being the one who's doing all the talking. I get that. But if our mouths are open, then our ears are probably closed. It's not often enjoyable to listen to people who have a different opinion than we do. Sometimes it's very, very frustrating when you disagree. Sometimes hearing the truth forces us to reflect upon ourselves and who we are and our behavior and what we believe. But even if it's difficult, even if it's painful, we cannot move ahead if we try to shut down the voices of others. We cannot move ahead until everybody is not only heard, but listened to. So this week and this season of Lent and beyond, I encourage you to not just speak the truth, but to also stop speaking sometimes and just listen. Seek out other news sources. Seek out the perspectives of somebody who thinks differently than you. Listen to the stories of those whose life experiences differ greatly from yours. And when someone shares their story, don't interject your own opinion, but ask questions. Be curious. This really is a call to practice humility, to admit that maybe we don't know everything and the opportunities are abundant. But this isn't the end. Listening is the beginning of change. Lent is about repenting, about turning and changing. And so once we listen, then we are called to do something about it. Again and again, friends, we are called to listen, to listen to one another and to listen to God. And so may we answer that call again and again. And may we be willing to do something about it. Amen. As we turn to our next hymn, uh, I remind you that if you have any prayer requests, please send them my way now.
During the season of Lent, many people take on spiritual disciplines to help them grow closer to God. One practice that some appreciate is reading or writing poetry. You are now invited into a time of meditation and contemplation as you hear The Way to Jerusalem is Cluttered from the book Kneeling in Jerusalem by Anne Weems. The way to Jerusalem is cluttered with bits and pieces of our lives that fly up and cry out, wounding us as we try to keep upon the path that leads to life. Why didn't somebody tell us that it would be so hard? In the midst of clutter, the children laugh and run after stars. Those of us who are wise will follow, for the children will be the first to kneel in Jerusalem. As we prepare to turn to God in prayer, we share our joys and our concerns so that as a community we can be in prayer for one another. We continue to pray for David Brady. Last week, you may remember that I mentioned he had a fall and a brain bleed, but then he came home on Saturday. He had another fall this week on Friday and is back in the hospital again. And they are looking at some possible medication changes. They're also looking at his tube feedings. He's re receiving all his nutrition uh, via tube feeding. And so we continue to pray for David and for his doctors and for Jamie Lynn and their family. Uh, Barb Graham asks for prayers for a sister of her co-worker named Kathy, who is facing some end-of-life decisions. And so we pray for her and her loved ones as they make those difficult decisions. We pray for the family of Linda and Mark Turner. Their son Matthew died Saturday morning of a heart attack at age 47. And that, uh, they were their friends of the Cezac family. We remember those we love who are living with cancer. We especially pray for John Whittington, Lynn Gehring, Edna May Knauer, and Burt Brewster. We continue to lift up Jane Witchie's daughter, Glenda, who is facing some health issues. And also uh, Kelly, Jack and Sharon's daughter, who is home, but dealing with uh, kidney and bladder issues. She's requiring IV medication, and some other things, but she has to go to work because work says she has to work. And so we pray for her and for your family as well. We remember Helen Bobbin, uh, who is 95 years old and is recovering from a fall and multiple broken bones in her hips and legs. We give thanks. Uh, Tom's going to be mad, but Barb asked for prayers. Tom had a little surgery this past Tuesday on his knee, and he's feeling much better. Clearly, he's here, and he's happy. So that's wonderful. He's feeling better for that. And we also pray uh, for Barb's dad, who is recovering from surgery also on Tuesday, uh, for a recurrence for his cancer. But he is doing very well post-surgery. We, uh, I also ask for prayers for the Pond family. They are friends of mine from seminary. They have eight children, uh, some biological, some adopted. And one of their youngest children, who's around Gabe's age, is um, undergoing inpatient psychiatric care. And so we pray for the family uh, as they're dealing with all of that in the midst of trying to be with all the other children. We have a friend, Allie, who has been joining us by Facebook. She's watching this morning. And Allie's aide from school, their uncle was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And so Allie, we're praying uh, for them and for you as well. We continue to pray for Ida Miller, our dear sweet Ida, and all of those who are living in long-term care facilities, as well as the staff. We pray for those dealing with chronic illness, those living with mental illness, those struggling with addiction, and all of those who give care. Let us now turn to God in prayer. O oh God of love, power, and faithfulness, we journey with your Son ever closer to Jerusalem. 
closer to his cross. We hear his words, take up your cross and follow me, but we aren't sure what that means. We hear his words, deny yourself and wonder which self it is. The one we put on for others or the one that we only show ourselves. Whichever it is, it seems that Jesus is sure asking a lot of us. And we don't know that we can do it. God, we need your Holy Spirit to be able to walk this path. We need your grace and mercy to be with us on this journey. So God, fill us with your Spirit. Heal our hurts. Calm our fears. Help us to trust in you. And help us to listen to you and to all of those around us. Help us to set aside our prejudices and biases so that we may truly be open to what others have to say. God, we ask for your healing touch, for your loving presence, for your guidance and discernment to be with those that we named here this morning. And now we lift before you those we hold in our hearts. Jesus, we remember that you empowered your disciples. You empowered the early Christians and the others who decided to follow you. And we believe that you will do likewise for us. May we be open to going where you lead. Hear this prayer, O oh God, and hear us now as with one voice united in spirit, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as you leave this time of worship, may your mouth speak God's goodness. May your arms hold those who are in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God that will never let you go and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. Amen.